All right. As we're uh, getting back in place soon enough to have not uh, picked up your tickets, uh, after this, we'll be having our luncheon. Uh, Elaine out front has the, uh, the tickets. So if you had your reserved and uh, haven't picked them up yet, you'll be able to get those from her. The luncheon will be next door in the next uh, conference room. Uh, I believe back when we had our second one of these, uh, the gentleman you're about to, to see came and uh, talked a little bit about the 819 in, but uh, we felt compelled to have him back to go into a little more detail because we just can't get enough of the, uh, the 819. All right, so what I'll do is turn the program over now to the Chief Mechanical Officer of the Project 819, Mr. Bill Bailey. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm actually the wrong kind of engineer of this sector of the railroad group, but uh, sometimes you're in the right place at the right time, and that's what actually what happened to me. Um, in 1982, I grew up on several business meetings, and uh, because my family was all railroad people, um, and my dad talked me out of going to work for a railroad, uh, the business associate said, well, gee whiz, there's a big steam engine in the park here in Pine Bluff. And I said, really? And they said, yeah, it's a big one. So I kind of become interested and I said, well, next time I come down, I'll burn my camera and take a picture of it. And I become a volunteer that day when I took a picture of A-19 setting in the park. Compliments of a gentleman who come walking up the same time I was there, who uh, was a retired cop belt engineer himself, railroad engineer. And he said, where do you go? One former organization called the Cotton Valley Rail Historical Society, and we want to cosmetically restore the engine. We want to repaint it. And uh, we're going to have a meeting, and he told me the date, and he asked me if I'd be interested in, you know, attending. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll come see what's going on. So when I walked in, they needed somebody to direct it. Uh, this was set them apart, uh, it had been vandalized. Uh, it had been sitting there 30 years, 819 had not hadn't had a, anything done to it other than the original paint job. So I was not involved with it and I was kind of a railroad in the same boat, turned into a director on this. So from there, uh, as a director, uh, we met with the city and they said, well, if you're going to cosmetically store it, and, and pay for the pain and all this, and we don't mind for you to do it. And we said, well, there's one catch in this, we want to move it out apart. We want to take it to another location and protect it. Well, after all the paperwork and the attorneys and everybody talked us over, we were allowed to do it, and our organization then grew to about 80 members, and we really got some, you know, support in it. So after that, we, uh, uh, Set up and we got all the gentleman by the name of uh, Jim Johnson, who was public relations officer for the railroad. And we told him our intention, and he got pretty enthused about it as cosmetically restored. And he said, Well, all these articles in the Cotton Valley newsletter. So it went on, and we, uh, with the assistance of the railroad, and a gentleman named Robert McClanahan, who at that time was a superintendent, and a gentleman by Mr. Lacey. Uh, you know, they gave us the green light to, with the railroad assistance, to move this engine. And uh, so they allowed the switch engine to come down, and we were arranged to have it moved up to the shop building in Pine Bluff, which was where we wanted to paint it. So what we had told the railroad at that point, we wanted to put it on our power property so it'd be protected. But anyhow, that, that didn't really gel out, and the public relations officer said, well, we don't want the liability and we donated it to the city and 
blah, blah, you know, this kind of thing. So um, we continued to cosmetically restore it. And uh, one day one of the engineers came up to me and he said, would you consider having this engine recertified? And I said, well, you know, first of all, I don't know that much about it. Secondly, I need a set of blueprints. And third, I got to have a lot of good support. And he said, well, we can get the support and skilled people. Because in the late 80s, there was one of 70 and 80 year old people that really were in the railroad in the steam era. And uh, they convinced me that they were pretty serious. Eh? So um, we kind of stopped on cosmetic and we started taking disassembly. The first thing I initiated was every part that we took off, we marked. Because again, to take something apart and put it back together is a different operation. So as it progressed, uh, the railroad was receptive to the idea, and that uh, they didn't really think we'd ever get it done, whether it would fall down to. But after about eight months, they realized we were, we were going to do it. I mean, you know, we were going to make a serious effort to do it. So we started getting the three-piece suit gentlemen over there, and, you know, we, we just been driving in. And our motto was, we're going to get this thing recertified. And meanwhile, I contacted the Federal Railway Administration, and I started getting going to people. And, and uh, lo and behold, a set of blueprints showed up accidentally. And after we got the blueprints, it was just like a green light for me. I mean, after that, and I said, you got your mechanical officer, but there's got to be three mechanical officers to restore this engine. And that was an FRA requirement. And uh, so we went to work on it, and uh, happily to say uh, it was completely restored, recertified uh, for Cotton Belt Railroad, not SP. Uh, SP had some special mechanical department requirements so far as if it ever went to the west coast they had tunnels and things that cotton belt didn't have so we had to do some special drawings and stuff to meet the criteria so i'm going to tell you a little bit about firemen uh like i was saying on the individual uh, actually as firemen back team and as a mechanical officer uh we our organization uh, had an attorney, and a lot of the legal things we ran by him to see, you know, exactly where we stood as an organization. We finally achieved an IRS tax exempt status, which really helped us. But uh, anyhow, the, the attorney reminded me when I told him that I was going to become a hotel officer, and he said, Well, who is actually going to sign the federal forms when it comes time to research? And I said, well, I haven't crossed that bridge yet, but, you know, I, I'll try to. And he said, well, let me remind you that any of those forms that's falsified this $5,000 fine and can be 10 years in prison. Well, here I call myself a chemical officer, and I got spanked about that. So I had a nice meeting with all the people that was helping us, and I said, you know, I don't mind signing the forms if I'm convinced that it's mechanically sound and it's safe to operate. And I said, that's that's going to be my goal on each and every appliance on the locomotive. That's that's where we went. And uh, we didn't stop after that. And I had a really good bar maker from uh, North Little Rock and spent 36 years with the Missouri Pacific in the bar shop. And we just had really good, skilled, know-how people that it actually worked for this. And they were my mentors. I'm telling you, I've learned a lot about steam engines. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about 819 uh, that I learned uh, and the process of actually firing it, to, which I just dearly love. There is, first of all, there's no onboard computers. There is nobody other than when you're firing a locomotive. Uh, you're your own creative self-operator. So you've got to have the tenacity or understanding of the mechanics of it to perform the job well. And that's true with a locomotive engineer. And it takes a pair of people to run a locomotive. 
And I didn't realize that. I always thought the glory was in the engineer. And that's generally what you heard about. But let me tell you that fireman played an important role in, in the performance of the locomotive to keep the accounting department handy. Because as you know, the top of that railroad was a freight road, uh, freight railroad from the start. And they were very interested in the cost per ton mile, which if they were making money, they were very happy. And the Cotton Belt always made money hauling freight. Uh, we were able to obtain a lot of the old records in time of before the merger. And uh, it's, what we did obtain was, it was quite remarkable of the history of the Cotton Belt. And uh, Blue Street Freight, which is one of the fastest operating freight trains in North America at one time, just what pulled most of them, 800 class locomotives. So that intrigued me about the speed of the locomotive and how, uh, for instance, the last time it was built, it was built in three months. Five locomotives in three months, they fabricated the time of love. 819 was the last one. And uh, it had all the refinements, everything that the predecessors didn't have. And the mechanical department of the Cotton Belt listened to the employees about how they can increase productivity and how they can maintain, you know, speed. So 800 was ideal. It meant, from my viewpoint and the people that I worked with in the 80s, the 800s met all the expectations of management and exceeded it in a lot of cases. They had very few problems in the last 10 that was built. Um, they, uh, they just had endless performance. To give you an idea, 819 came out of the shop on uh, February the 3rd, 1943. And this is the war years. They rolled it out on that morning. It went out to a yard track. They exercised it for three and a half hours. And this is all in the records in Pine Bluff. The next day, it was a train service. The next day. And everybody that worked on the first, second, third shift of this, the superintendent gave them all a cigar. And it's rolled in there that the railroad furnished and gave every employee on all three shifts that worked on this to get 819 completed and got a cigar. So I guess they were all smoked in the building. Um, okay. St. Louis Southwestern Local Money 819 was donated to the city of Pine Bluff in July of 1955. Uh, it was placed in the park and sat there for 30 years. Uh, the unique thing about it, it went on the way out of plumbing. Uh, 819 was in really good shape when we got it cosmetically restored. It had class one inspection and repairs in 1952. And that made new tires and everything was put on it. Uh, Old uh, 819 uh, in our plan to move it. Um, we had a lot of good assistance to do it. And like I mentioned to you, we had only planned to cosmetically restore it. Um, but uh, the museum in Pine Bluff was, was created um, just because of 819 and the railroad's effort. That's all I can say about it. The building that it's in, which it's currently in, uh, it's 120 feet wide, 300 foot long, with a transfer table, and uh, 12 acres of land around it. Walls of the city of Pine Bluff, and uh, I can't tell you how immensely important all this was to what we've done in the restoration. There's a 15 ton overhead crane inside the building that all it needed to do was to be electrically reconnected, and that was a great asset on trying to disassemble it and put it back together. I will say this, that people who come together as a team uh, with skills can achieve large tasks. And I just, you know, that's just about what I can say. About two and a half years that I volunteered uh, in the effort of getting K-19 back to the point where the federal inspector said, sign all the forms and I'll sign off and we'll turn it over to the manager of the railroad and you can run with it. I can't tell you how I felt that day when that came about. I'm still, I'm still on a learning curve about standards. <coughs> They're the most intriguing machine I think I've ever dealt with. They're the most human of all made man machines. And uh, they talk to you. Uh, they're, 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 we 
we understand the sound, we understand the motions, and uh, all this has to do with how you adopt a hobby that I call my restoration project a hobby. Now my wife will tell you otherwise. You know, she thought I was married today, don't they? But uh, it was a it was a fun trip for me. I learned a lot. Uh, I had so many good people that helped tutor me and answer my questions. Uh, 819 last run in active service in 1953. And uh, uh, it's according to the records we have, 819 total operational miles was 804,800 miles. Now, and that was at the age of 10 years and 10 months old. Um, it was a mainline locomotive at uh, 376 tons. You didn't take it on a branch line or a wood trussle that wasn't built for it. So uh, again, it was a mainline locomotive. It got in high-speed train service. So far as I know, in talking to all the employees, it never got on a passenger train. It may have got on troop trains, but I don't actually know that. But the records we have been showing that except freight service. Um, the uh, average miles, to give you an idea of how that two and a half years under war efforts, how they put these engines to work, the records show that uh, the average miles per month was 6,140 miles. That meant it was doing 198 miles per day. And like I say, it was just constant. And uh, they just done minimal repair on them, and uh, that's what's remarkable about this engine. That uh, you know, they put the miles on it and they put it to use. It didn't have roller bearings on it. And I'm going to tell you about a story about how to inspect roller bearings, and uh, in a few minutes, um, A19's train speed, especially like when the cotton belt loose through freight. Um, we had people that told a lot of different stories, but I'm, in, in reviewing the timetables, I know it ran with 40 to 60 cars and 45 to 60 miles an hour. There were some locations that run 60 and 65 miles an hour on bolted track with friction bearings. And uh, it was a powerhouse, pound for pound, 819 produced uh, the tractive force, cylinder horsepower, and a balanced effort. And that's what made the locomotive so unique. It fit in the cotton belt, which is basically a flat territory. Yeah, they did have some 67,000 foot grades at 1%, but it wasn't a mountain railroad. It was basically a flat territory. So they, with a good balanced engine, with a good engineer and a good fireman, they could they could get these things on the road and do it in a remarkably good time. Um, I will say this about riding in the camp, A19. Um, all steam engines generate vibration as the speeds increase. It's just the nature of the beast. Uh, A19 was well balanced. It had what they call box boat drivers on them, which at that time was the best of technology offered roller bearings. And uh, the thing that I noticed between 48 and 55 miles an hour, depending on train tonnage and the track conditions, that's when the vibration in 819 just started. You just feel it. And so when I say feel it, one thing I learned about a good locomotive engineer, not only could he blow the whistle, not only did he have a feeling for the throttle, and not only could he run the air brakes on the train, but he knew when that engine was topped out. He knew, he could tell the way it vibrated, a lot of it was half dead. And I always said, if you can't hear, how does he know that? Well, they, they simply would put their feet on the deck or put their hand on something metal, and they could feel that energy in that locomotive working. And I learned, a, I learned a lot from just the harmonics and the vibrations of being in the cab of, of A19. Um, being the case, 819 in my opinion was a well-balanced, well-constructed prince of an engine. And don't get me wrong, the Missouri Pacific had some 2,244 mountain types. 
that was a welder type engine. A uh, lot of railroads had under 40 for it. It wasn't the heaviest locomotive, but by any means it wasn't the lightest one. But it, it made money for the cotton belt freight industry and, and management. Um, so it was a very smooth riding locomotive. It was a challenge to fire, but I loved it. Because every time you fired it, you learned something. And uh, I'll tell you about, quickly here, we're running out of time. I'll, I want to tell you about a trip. The SP, like I say, had their own mechanical department criteria. For some reason or another, they always thought that that engine might go to the West Coast. I didn't think it'd ever go to the West Coast. But I didn't understand it the thought of what management might be thinking. So they, um, they put out some mechanical regulations. Uh, one of the things that they told us, and particularly come down to my hands was, we need you to visually inspect the roller bearings on the locomotive tender. Well, that was a serious problem to us because you could inspect the inside set of bearings, but you had to pull the drive wheels off the axle to inspect the outside. So, <clears throat> you know, it was uh, one of those obstacles that we had to overcome. And, uh, <clears throat> so I get on the horn, and I call Tampkin Roller Bearing, and I, I explained the dilemma I was in. I said, are there anybody there can tell me how to test these bearings on this little bit outside set that visually you can't see? And uh, we had a ultrasound machine that we bought that I could read flaws nine inches deep to speak. And like crank pins, we could see if there's a void place or had sure cracks or anything like this. But they didn't tell me anything about the bearings. So I, I called Delphine. I was trying to find out, and I get a hold of like a products manager, and he was real nice about it, and he said, well, so the only gentleman I know does consultant work for us, and he's retired from our company, but he was the last person that dealt with railroad bearings on steam engines, and he said, I'll try to get him to come back to the plant, and I'll set up a, a, a call that we can talk about this. And I, you know, I thank him and I appreciate it. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll never hear from this guy again. I mean, you know, it, it was kind of one of those conversations. I didn't know him and he didn't know me. But sure enough, two days later, later, he, he called me up and said, I've got this gentleman on the phone. And uh, I, he said, there's a couple things I want to ask you. First, he wanted to know the, he wanted to know the size of the axle on the one of the And I told him, and he said, how much weight is on the drivers? And I told him. And uh, the next thing he asked me, he said, uh, did the locomotive in the 30 years of setting it apart, how was it faced? And I thought, what in the world does that have anything to do with it? And what he told me was that over 30 years with the sun shining on whichever side of the locomotive, that's where the oil perked off the top of the bearing. The, the bearings on 819, like I say, were tempered and tapered roller bearings, and they had an oil bath in the bottom in a pan. When the bearings rotated around, it picked the oil up and went over the top of the bearing. And his concern was that he sat there for 30 years, and he said, there's only one test you can do that I know that will authenticate the condition of it. And I said, well, just what is that? And he said, what you have to do you have to get that locomotive out and run it 20 or 25 miles above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. He said, get off the locomotive with a very sensitive heat gun and read every axle on it and document it. Get back in the engine and run it from 65 to 70 miles an hour for 10 miles. Get off the engine again, read the temperature, and if you got a 12 degree variation, you got a bearing problem. Well, I thank him and appreciate it, but I thought, now how in the world are we ever going to convince SP to let us run that engine 65 to 70 miles an hour for 10 miles when they'd already set the speed limit at 55? So 
my assistant uh, said, I, I got an idea on this. Uh, he said that, uh, why don't you uh, call the West Coast and get on the goal on the corner? Now, I understand he ran the American Freedom Train all over the country, and he knew SP real well. So I get on the phone, and again, I don't know Noel McCormick, and he don't know me. But I call this guy up, and I tell him what, you know, my dilemma was. And he got real enthused about it. And he said, well, I'll tell you, let me make one phone call, and tomorrow you call a gentleman named uh, Robin Rudenberg. And, because uh, he was Senior Vice President of Transportation for SP. And I said, okay, that's fair enough. So I go back to my group and kind of bluff. I, I tell you, my volunteer group, what you know, our tensions are, and they said, SP will never let you run that engine that fast to test it. And I said, well, I'm just telling you what the Tenth and Roller Bearing Man said. So the next day, I, I did get a hold of Robin, and I talked to him about it, and he said, let me think on this. And uh, I said, okay. And he called me back and said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I want to come to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and meet your crew. And I want to be in the cab when you're running this engine 70 miles an hour. And I said, I would love to. I'll meet you at the airport. And, he, and anyhow, he, he came to me. You know, we, he said, the only term I'm going to set on this is, he said, I want you to find a stretch of track where there's minimum grade crossings. Well, we jumped on the bandwagon to find out where there's a minimum grade crossing for 10 miles on the cotton belt. Well, it just happened to be when you go across the Washtenaw River at Camp in Arkansas, going north, it's just through timber company, country, and all this. And uh, so I told him, I said, well, we found a 10 mile stretch of track that's relatively flat. And uh, there's only three great crossings. And the next question out of his mouth was, he said, was this a county road that a school bus runs on? And I said, no, it's a county road. It's not a school bus. It's a mail route. And he said, okay. He said, getting ready. So, boy, you know. And I had an engineer uh, that uh, he was he was an artist on the throttle. And he also was very good with the air. And uh, A19 didn't have a horn worth anything on her. It, uh, matter of fact, it was homemade out of a piece of six inch board to warp it and allow them to put brass bell. They had a brass bell, but the cotton bell actually sent the brass to all the locomotive works in the West Strap to get the five bells made for the five locomotives. But uh, Robert got up in the cab, and uh, there was a gentleman named Frank Stone. He had an older brother named Jack Stone, and both was talking about locomotive engineers. And uh, I told Frank, I said, open this thing up. I said, I'm interested in it too. Rollin was up there, and he said, I'm going to tell you what, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to signal to you when I want you to shut it down. And uh, fair enough. I said, you know, and my assistant was firing on this. And, uh, Oh, Darrell, I said, open it up, turn the floor on, I go, put the oil to it. And uh, I mean, we roared out, we crossed the Washtenaw River Camden, and we just got on the outer sea limits, and we knocked the leaves off the trees when we were out that, that area down there. We got it up to about 65, and then we just, it just eased it into that 70, and uh, we were running 70 miles, 72 miles an hour, and that was my experience at 72 miles an hour in the cab of uh, 800 locomotive. Uh, the speed on it for only 19 was zero to 90. I don't have any doubt that locomotive would run 90 miles an hour. And I've heard all kinds of different stories about running real fast. But uh, anyhow, we ran it about 11 miles. And I bail off the locomotive with my heat sinks and gut. And I couldn't, I can't tell you, I couldn't wait to get these readings. And uh, the variation was five degrees. And I, and I, was, it, I was thrilled to death to know that we didn't have a problem. 
And I can tell SP that we had done the test recommended by Tim and Earl Murray. Now, uh, going before me, when they moved 44-49 around, it didn't, it didn't set for 30 years, like 8-19 years. So the oil was lubricated in 49, uh, uh, the SP engine, for whatever reason in the yard here. Um, so we had a green light after that, uh, even if I wanted to take it to the West Coast. All right, I'm, I'm going to throw some numbers at you, and I don't want to bore you, but I'll try to explain them to you from, from my experience. First of all, I mentioned uh, there was five of these locomotives built during the war years. Uh, November, December, January, and February, 1942 and 1943. Um, we actually had a final bill of sale uh, from the accounting department. And uh, 819 cost $143,607. And after looking at about six pages of figures, they even put down the pennies and the nickels of the product cost. But lo and behold, it wound up being even dollars. And I always thought, how ironic that that is. Uh, it's, a pretty, it's a recently heavy locomotive. Like I say, it weighs 374 tons with 15,000 gallons of water and 5,000 gallons of fuel on board. Um, it has a factor of adhesion of four, and for the people that's got mechanical uh, aptitude, what this uh, factor of adhesion done? It prevented wear on the tires. And uh, if you slip the drivers on a locomotive, it wears them off just like the soles on your shoes. So uh, it was a Real important assets, and again, the cylinder horsepower, the tractive effort was balanced, and uh, the locomotive that propelled itself down the road had very little slippage. It had 70 inch drivers. Now, how big is 70 inch drivers? Well, put it in perspective. One revolution of that wheel advanced the locomotion 18 feet down the track, and uh, the at the time 819 was fabricated. The other railroads that was building 44 northern type locomotives, most of their drivers was in the range of 69 to 80 inch. And some of the uh, Santa Fe and the Union Pacific had hundreds of miles of prairie, and they, they didn't mind. They, they needed the speed, and they, they needed the effort to roll the locomotive a lot of miles. So they didn't look at operational costs. They were looking at speed, and particularly in the passenger service. Uh, the board of pressure on 819 was 250 pounds per square inch. It was superheated steam, and I'm going to say a little bit more about superheated steam. Uh, the boiler rating, uh, to give you an idea for people that uh, deal with steam boilers, uh, 819 easily can do 65,800 pounds of steam per hour. and uh, it doesn't do us because it was 8,010 feet of superheat to the inside of 200 three and a half inch flues in that locomotive. So it was a powerhouse. And I literally, I mean, pound for pound, it produced lots of steam. And with lots of steam, you can get places fast. And you can do a lot of tracking effort and move a lot of cars with it. Um, to give you an idea of uh, what 61,000 pounds of steam is, it's about equal to an SD40 in notch 8, which is about 3,300 horsepower. So if you put a diesel engine out there on a track with 3,000 horsepower engine, that's what 819 had. That power was up to about 28 miles an hour. So that's the difference between a diesel locomotive and a steam engine. That 3,000 horsepower is Everything is 3,000 horsepower until the boiler can no longer make steam fast enough to keep the horsepower rate up in the engine. That was no problem on 800. They had, they had plenty of ability to make steam. Um, I mentioned the brass valves. Uh, there's a record showing that the hot belt railroad shipped scrap valves and hinges and everything that you, that become brass to the ball and all the money for us. And 
actually cast those ballots and ship them back to the railroad because this is doing government priority war efforts and you couldn't get precious metal. As a matter of fact, the builder's plates, the jacket plates on the cylinders on the, on the last five, they were cast steel, they were the bronze. Uh, luckily, the roller bearings was ordered prior to the priority numbers being put on all products like that. Uh, I believe that, like I say, that, uh, a steam engine is the most human of all made by any steam uh, engines. And uh, I, I want to say a little bit about superheated steam. And it's, it's really hard to explain to people, but I, I'm going to make an effort. Uh, when you heat steam, um, and you keep adding more heat to it, it becomes more efficient because your basic science says you can't compress a liquid. But when you convert a liquid to a gas, you very much so can expand it. Now let me put this in perspective. And I had an old water maker who tell me this, and he said, you don't remember anything else. Consider one cubic inch of water and convert it to steam, and it expands 1,600 times its original size. So you wonder where the pressure on a 26-inch cylinder got in a locomotive, how it exerted that much traffic, tractive force. Um, steam is, as, as my old water maker said, it's very unforgiving. Um, if you make a mistake with steam, you generally don't live to tell about it. And uh, I can assure you of steam that is superheated. One time I made a calculation on it, I figured a two inch steak it would take about a minute and 45 seconds to cook it at 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Superheated steam, you can't see it for about six inches. It's completely clear and then it condenses and then you, then you can see what we call saturated steam. This made the locomotive very, very efficient so far as tracking power. Um, the, um, the flues that's in 819 are 20 feet long. There's 200 of those things. And uh, the superheat tubes go in and out. They weave in about four different rounds, three decks high. And um, not only do you heat it for the second time, but you heat it the second time. And the second time, the pour goes into the cylinders itself. The throttle on A19 is what they call American front end throttle valve. And if you're familiar with race cars, it's called a pocket valve. And the reason why this is a real unique thing to people is that the artistry of running the throttle on the locomotive, it let the steam in in a uniform volume, like in eight different levels. And uh, you, you, could, uh, you could, what they call notch it. And if you had a real good hand at operating the locomotive, you didn't ever have to spend the driver so many hundred. Now, if you didn't know what you was doing, you'd go and draw the real hard. Uh, you bet you you could spend the drivers on 800. But the railroad management didn't like that. Because uh, if you were on dry rails and you were fully loaded and you spun the wheels real hard, you left eight notches on top of the rail for the driver's step. And uh, so the railroad didn't have a very good appreciation for uh, notching the rails. Um, I, wanna, I wanna say a little bit about the final modifications that was part of the construction of A15 and, and through A19. And don't get me wrong, there was other modifications done to the five predecessors before that. But A19 had all of them. And this is what made it a joy privilege to be a part of fire business. It was a base that the railroad had, not only from the mechanical engineering department, operations department, but the crew. Um, for instance, they, the mechanical department listened at all the crews about how do we run this faster? How do we get it over the division? Uh, and uh, so one thing the fire would come up with, they needed a slow stack line. And of course, 
you know, I didn't know what a smoke stack light was for, and so I asked. That's the way I learned a lot. And what happened at night, the fireman had no way of seeing what the color of the smoke was. So he turned that light on, and he knew that he had a good combustion right Man, that's great. The modification that, you know, they, they asked for and they got. Um, they was, when he was in the engineer's seat, you had the injector sitting under you. You had a brake stand set to your left and the back of the head to keep you warm. But on the fireman's side, your front burn up and your back froze to death and your feet froze off. So what they done, they put a little heat coil in the, in the floorboard on the fireman's side to keep your feet warm. And the 819 still has it and still operates. It had a, what they call a barco little water alarm. And uh, this was outside only to start with. And um, what would happen at the roundhouse is get engineering, and uh, if they wasn't real careful, they'd let the water get too low in it and go in the water. Well, for the railroad operators that had to go in a hole and work on uh, opposing traffic, um, they had a tendency to want to take a little nap for students. And that's the one very thing that you couldn't do to fire an 800. It just, it just consumed too much water. And I'm going to mention here just in a minute what I found that it, that it used for a mile. But, uh, so they put a low water alarm inside the cab. So if the crew was sitting in the hole and they wanted to take a little break and they let the water get too low, it, you know, it, it let them know real loud. Um, like I say, they had a speedometer on it and it was from zero to 90 miles an hour. They had a temperature gauge in the fuel tank. Now, I never run 819 in cold weather. I mean, I can't tell you what it's like to run a steam engine when it's zero degrees. But now the guys that came from East St. Louis can tell you about cold weather, cold weather run. But it was important to the farmers to know what the temperature of the oil was in the tank. Because it had a lot to do with the atomizing, which blurred in the firebox, which generated BTUs, which went to steam. So, again, it was just uh, one of those additional things that they had. Uh, and now, the most basic low water indicator on the tender that I think anybody could ever think of. It had a little pet cock valve down at the bottom of the tender on the engineer's side, and he could get out of the cab and open that, and if water ran out of the tender, he had over a thousand gallons. If it didn't run out of it, he had less than a thousand gallons. Okay, 819 consumed somewhere between 200 and 225 gallons per mile evaporating water. It burned from 6 to 12 gallons of fuel oil per mile. So if you had 1,000 gallons of water left in your tank, uh, you didn't have very many miles to it. You better get some water in it. Now I'm going to tell you about superheated steam when I learned about it. I did a calculation on the, the uh, the level of water that was in the boiler on, the, on these 800s. There was three and a half inches of water in the sight glass. And the sight glass is a, was an indicator on what was the right level to have water to be in the boiler. It also had another three and a half inches below that. It had seven inches of water in the boiler. And with the seven inches of water, there was ideally for running at a half, what you call a half the sight glass. And most of the engineers like to do this. Now, some of the engineers like to run it below it. And that's where they didn't consume as much water, but they were making more steam than the engine was designed for. And it just scared the fool out of me because I found out if that water ever disappeared out of that side glass, how long it would take to evaporate three and a half inches of water on top of the crown sheet. And the crown sheet is the, basically the top of the firebox. It takes seven minutes if you use hard part in an engine for that water to evaporate off the crown tube. And we practiced, let me tell you, we practiced that if the worth of feed water station failed, how quick we could get to the injector and get that injector going. It had a backup just in case that happened. It never happened to us, but we, we actually taught ourselves that by people that you know, had a great respect for it. And uh, believe you me, it was, uh, you know, the, the truth is in the figures. And uh, when you consider that uh, a mistake like that can be very deadly, 
And if you've ever seen a boiler explosion on a boat, it's catastrophic. Steam is lasting. And uh, when I say 200, 250 pounds per square inch, that's every square inch of that boiler inside of it. And when you let that kind of pressure go 600 degrees Fahrenheit, it's like stretching a long rubber band and turning it loose. So it literally rips the boilers off of the loads and go back up in a rice field. And, uh, and they, you know, they just don't survive in the fuel behind it. They're just not, I mean, except like I say, you can cook it. Uh, two inch steak less than a minute or a little over a minute. I don't have to tell you what the steam coming out of that boiler would do for you. Uh, the uh, A19 I found had a balance of fuel consumption and water consumption. I found out that the uh, a good team, I'm talking about a good locomotive engineer and a good fireman that work together, Charlie and Kev, uh, he could fire around eight gallons a mile for fuel consumption. The actually number four fuel oil was the best oil we could get our hands on. It made the most people to use. It was the easiest fire. But the uh, water consumption on it just, you know, sometimes if you blew the water down and you used the whistle a lot, you just use more water than you were actually fire. But it would run anywhere from 150 to 230 gallons a mile. Depending on the tonnage, uh, how good the operator was. <coughs> and uh, so they were, um, they were wonderful locomotives. I feel privileged to be able to say, as a young man in the 1980s, that I fired a steam locomotive, and especially one of this size and this nature. It, uh, it was a great challenge to me, very rewarding. And, uh, I still feel mechanically very much involved with it. And still, like I said, I'm learning the curve of the thing. Let me tell you about some things that the crews didn't like about. You know, talk about how good they were. Uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the problems the uh, 815 3 had, they had no decent tender backup line. Like one of the insurers told me, he said, it's like trying to light a ball for the old candles. And uh, it was, it's a poor slide of those things. And uh, I asked one of the crew members, my dad said, why is this such an issue? And he said, well, if you ever had to go out and press through a train and you had to go backwards at 40 miles an hour, 25 or 30 miles after all the division, <coughs> and collapse onto somebody and pull them back in. You knew what I was talking about. And uh, the uh, whistle on 819 <clears throat> uh, was handmade in a motor shop. The unique thing about these 800s, the whistle, two inch header, came off the superheated steam from the sewer. So that the whistle ran off superheated steam. And that was not true with the KCS, not true in the service center, and I never heard anybody explain to me why this happened on the non -delegation. But anyhow, if you, uh, if you blew this whistle and you're standing under, you didn't stand under it very long because that superheated steam was so hot that the time it condensed and fell on you, it looked like, it felt like somebody's throwing hot water on you in little speckles. So you, uh, it was too, you weren't too happy to be around it. So, also they had a very bad tongue. Uh, I used to call it the sick cow or the mad bull or whatever. That bull or two, and I, I don't know who made uh, I never could find that out. But apparently he didn't tune the organs or pianos because if you take a good whistle like Crosby or Ludenheimer or something like this, they were called step tops. And uh, they actually had notes. Well, 819 only had one note. It's a bell. And uh, it didn't sound good. And uh, one of the things that people identify on the money is the sound of the whistle. And the, the guy that performs it. So if you've got a whistle that has notes in it, it's music to the degree or it is fine. Um, so we have cured that problem. We're going to be certified. I have a three-stepper now 
that we're going to put back on A19, and it will have a good tone, and you can play it, and it will sound real good. I mentioned to you about the power of A19 and the ability to perform work uh, and medium and high speed if you uh, open the throttle up too fast, it would burn the rails. And, uh, you know, that was the thing that you just had to have a feel and touch for. If the rails was wet, and it was all on, and you know, all these things had something to do with spoil speed. Um, I always felt like the long body should have step lights on On a dark night, it was really hard to find the bottom two steps. And if you try to get on and off a piece of body power, and you can't see where your feet is going, it's not a very good thing. It don't make you feel good. Um, okay, two things and then I'll shut. Um, I understand this is a wartime uh, application. Uh, one of the modifications that the five engines had to have, they couldn't get nickel steel alloy side rods on it. So when they built the local ones, they had to complete the them. They done all that right there in the mechanical industry part. All of it was done right there in the pine block. And, uh, as a consequence, is like I say, it's a very smooth operating locomotive. Now, 807, which was the one of the first 10 they bought, come from all the locomotives. And it was, as they used to say, it was the step child of the dog. And the reason why, it had a very unusual vibration that nobody could figure out what caused it. And when I say nobody could figure out what caused it, it was such a concern of all the locomotive works that they brought a new set of axles and a new set of slow driver now and installed them on the locomotive trying to correct it. It didn't solve it. I always thought they could have a bent frame and saw a line that was not quite right or something on it. And uh, in 1942, during war years when they were running so many miles on it, the doctor Bell took 807 in the shop and put a whole set of box spokes drivers on it which was a really neat way of balancing locomotive drivers. They still didn't get the vibration out of it. It went to St. Louis to the salvage yard and was cut up and scrapped and it still was vibrating. Like I said, the, the crews was, they were scared of it after 60 miles an hour. It's like one crew that said, uh, you almost had to blow your false teeth in twice before you got to East St. Louis. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it vibrated that bad and it was a real concern to the crew people. Nobody seemingly could solve what it was. Uh, I progressed as a volunteer from project director to the fireman to the mechanical officer to the chief of the mechanical officer, and uh, I enjoyed it. And, uh, and um, I'm still happy to be a part of it. And like I say, uh, I'd like to talk at another time about the restoration, which was challenge from day one until we finish it. And, uh, but I would like to talk about that again one of these days. Two things I'm going to leave you with. Uh, I asked her attorney one day, I said, are there any very unusual laws dealing with operation of railroad locomotives? He said, well, I've never really had this question asked before. But uh, he said, I've got a secretary that's just a good word of research. And he said, I'm going to send her on that and ask her if she can find out any strange laws. Two of them. Couldn't find any in Missouri. Couldn't find any in Illinois. But guess what? There is one on the books in the state of Arkansas that reads as follows. And this is uh, uh, to keep uh, cattle from grazing along the railroad tracks. Arkansas passed a law against letting Russian, Russian thistle and Johnson grass going to seed along the tracks. I've seen a few of that growing when I come down along the interstate. Now Texas, Texas had an unusual law. Now Texas law states blankets must be washed every 90 days on railroads charging ticket fares. So I guess uh, every 90 days you got to bring blankets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming and talking about the experience with A19. We'll have to have you back about the, uh, the restoration. We do thank you.
All right, I think folks are ready for us for the luncheon. Uh, and it will be right next door here. The shortcut is through the doors here at the front. If you have your ticket, if you have not picked up your uh, tickets to have reserved, uh, you can go around this way and, and check with Elaine, and she will uh, get that in between any tickets that folks haven't picked up yet. All right, and uh, otherwise, I think uh, Dad is out there ready to, to collect your tickets as we go in. It's buffet. Style, give you which one, and then uh, pick a seat, and we'll uh, have musical entertainment from uh, Leo Sykes. Okay.